In this video, I'm going to run through the usage of Vapor 3's beta release that just came out on November 30th, 2017. Here, we see a synopsis of what I'll cover. Each of these topics will have timestamped links at the bottom of the video for your quick reference later on, so that you can reference individual components if you need to. I'm going to start off the video by loading a dataset into Vapor. After that, I'm going to create one renderer of the four that we currently support in Vapor 3 beta, and then after I have that renderer loaded, I will go through Vapor's uh, new graphical user interface, which uh, subcategorizes all of the renderer's utilities and properties into uh, tabs that we call the Variables tab, the Appearance tab, and the Geometry tab. Finally, I'll load a second data set that we can render simultaneously with the first data set that we've loaded to do intercomparisons uh, visually in real time. So over here I have my session on Geyser. I'm uh, going to do this demonstration in Linux. And to start Vapor, I will type in vgl run dot slash Vapor. Uh, and I'm currently in my uh, installed Vapor directory. So when you install Vapor, you will be prompted with a path that you get to pick where the installation occurs. And this is mine. It's in my home directory, and I'm in the binary directory uh, after Vapor has been installed. So to run, I will type vgl run dot slash vapor. And if you're on a Mac or Windows, um, basically you'll just double click on the icon and um, on Mac that'll probably be in your applications directory and on Windows you'll probably have a desktop icon that you can just double click from there. And that will bring you to this window that we see right here. Now by default, most of the elements in the GUI that we can see over here on the left and on the top panel are disabled, and that's because we don't have a data set loaded. So the first thing I'm going to do is click on File, and I'm going to import a WRF ARW data set. Now, Vapor, like in Vapor 2, can import different file types. Uh, we can import WRF, MetCDF, CF compliant data, and impasse. Alternatively to, direct, to directly importing um, these three types of files, we can open a Vapor data collection, which is uh, a set of these files that has been converted into Vapor's VDC data type. And the VDC data type allows you to progressively uh, visualize your data at different levels of compression, whether it's being very compressed or whether it's being uh, rendered with perfect reconstruction. And the reasoning that we uh, do this is because uh, often with large data sets, it's much easier and much faster to, to render uh, scenes with compressed data so that you can explore it and uh, find the color palettes you want and isolate the observables that you're trying to highlight. And then once you have your color palette and your observables, after that you can crank the uh, compression uh, or turn it off in, in other words. You can, you can crank up your fidelity back to perfect reconstruction and then press play and then let your computer render over the course of hours or days depending on how big your data set is. But for our purposes, I'm going to directly import my data, and I won't have any of this uh, compression um, functionality baked into my visualization. So I'm going to navigate to my directory, <clears throat> and I'm going to load worth out domain 3. So this is the smallest domain out of this nested series of runs. And this file is about 120 20 gigabytes in size. And here we have our domain. The controls are the same as they were in Vapor 2. Left mouse button rotates the scene, right mouse button zooms out and in, and middle mouse button traverses the scene. Over here, all my widgets have been enabled, and I'm going to create a new renderer by clicking on New. And our currently supported renderers are Barbs, Contours, Image, and 2D Data. I'm going to click on 2D Data, and note that you also need to specify your data source. Right now, I have one WORF file loaded, and I'm going to select that one. It's my only option. So now I have my first renderer, a 2D data renderer, belonging to dataset WORFOUT D03. To turn it on, I'm going to click on this checkbox, and here we have our first rendering. If you look over to the left, I'm going to talk about our new GUI, where we kind of uh, separated out all the different properties of the renderers and then categorized them into three different groups to uh, give some more organization to uh, what we uh, use to control Vapor. 
So over here in the variables tab, we have our variable selection where we can define the currently rendered variable name. In this case, it's height. And we can also define a height variable to offset our rendered variable uh, by. So instead of rendering height, I'm going to click on T2. And um, basically, this is temperature near the surface. And all visualization is really an exploratory and iterative process. It, it takes a lot of trial and error and experimentation to find exactly what you need. This isn't the first time I've looked at this data. So I know that time step 14 has the observable that I'm interested in, which is a cold pool in the Great Plains of America. So to change my time step up in the navigation bar, I clicked in 14, pressed enter, and this is a cold pool that's being researched by Brian Squitieri of uh, Iowa State University, who is researching uh, nighttime thunderstorms in the Great Plains. Uh, he's been generous enough to let me use this data set as an example for Vapor 3 data. And what I will end up doing later is showing the different um, nested domains in WORF simultaneously by loading multiple data sets. But before I do that, I need to go to my Appearance tab over here and edit the, uh, the transfer function. If you're a user of Vapor 2 and you look under the Appearance tab, you'll see this familiar transfer function over here. And what this does is it lets you apply opacity and color to your data. The way that we do that is by drawing a histogram. It's a probability density function of your variable that basically just shows how often different values of that variable come up within the region that you're rendering to. So we have a few values, like very few values over here on the left tail, around 288 to 289. And we can, kind of, we can see that it curves up as we approach this middle peak around 291.8 degrees Kelvin. And then the maximum values are around 293. Since I've already uh, tinkered with this data set before, I already know that I want to set my minimum and maximum values to 289. and 293. So color gets applied to the values of the variable in this PDF um, according to the color directly below, if, if that made any sense. So if I go to this middle value, 291.8, and I go down here, I get this kind of faded red color applied to that value. Over here on the right, at the higher magnitude values, we get a deeper red, and over at the other tail end, we have blue, white in the middle. So that's how color is applied. Opacity is done with this green line up here at the top. I can click on these control points and drag them down. And the lower that this green line is in correspondence to the, vari the, va the variable value at that point determines how opaque or transparent it is. So basically, if I take this guy and pull it all the way down, all of these values have complete transparency applied. And as we get lower, it gets more and more opaque. These values over here are completely opaque, 100% opacity. And you can see these are the blue values. And we can also see over in the rendering that we only see blue. Based on my experience dealing with this data set, I think I liked this when I had this opacity value at 292.9. So I'm going to scroll over and put it about right there. And right here, I'm kind of masking out the highest values in T2 and then kind of highlighting the lower ones below 289. If I take this guy and bring it all the way up, you can see that uh, the, the really it, the, the, this cold pool I'm trying to highlight is, uh, I don't know, it's, there's a little bit of a distraction going on between all these saturated red values. And so I'm going to mask those out by bringing this far control point down. Further down in the Appearance tab, we have our color bar settings. If I click on this checkbox, I get a color bar annotation that I'm going to play with and try to make a little more legible. The font size is a little small, so I'm going to bring this up to about 20. And I'm going to increase the Y size because the numbers are a little crowded to something like that. I can add an annotation. Space, 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 space. T2. 
is what I want to call this color bar. And I'm going to bring it a little bit to the left on the x-axis. So that's a basic render. Um, additionally, in, in addition to the appearance tab, we also have the geometry tab. Um, so to reiterate, the three basic tabs for all renderers are variables, where you pick your variables, appearance, where you edit the transfer function, and some other ancillary properties. And then finally, there's the geometry tab, which lets you specify what region of the data you're actually drawing. I can, can take my minimum and maximum sliders and reduce the region that I'm drawing to on the X and Y planes. And for 3D variables, which will be supported in the future with Vapor, but not with a beta release, um, with 3D variables, there will be a Z coordinate controller. Um, the reasoning for this is that, uh, for example, if you are looking at a very large variable and you're low on memory, you can reduce the amount of data that you're loading into memory by reducing the region you're drawing to, which um, can optimize your performance depending on what you're trying to do. So now I'm going to expand my geometry back out because um, this isn't that memory intensive. Um, another uh, feature we support is the ability to copy different regions from different renderers. So say for example if I had one renderer that was being uh, drawn to the lower right or the, the upper right quadrant of your domain, I could create another renderer and copy this quadrant and then render those two renderers in the exact same area by just clicking on this drop down menu. Of course you're going to need more than one renderer to copy a region from one to the other. The last part, the geometry tab that I'll mention, is the um, transform tab, which will let you scale your data, translate it, rotate it, and then set the origin. Basically what this is doing is it allows you to adjust the positioning of your data according to uh, basically arbitrary values that the user gets to define. You can translate on X, Y, and Z. You can rotate about X, Y, and Z. And finally, you can scale on X, Y, and Z. For example, I'll scale my Z axis by 100. And I'll go over back to my variables tab and I'll apply a height variable. So now you can really see what the surface looks like. Um, the, sur the surface of the Great Plains where this cold pool exists uh, based on the height variable that I'm applied. But really only because I'm scaling the geometry by a factor of 100. If I turn this back down to 1, it's a lot harder, if not impossible, to tell that there is any height being applied. So in most of these weather data sets, we end up stretching the z-axis by some factor. Factor of 100 does a decent job of giving a uh, topological feeling for where we're at. So those are the three tabs, variables, appearance, and geometry. And these tabs also exist for our contour renderer, our barb renderer, and our image renderer. I'm not going to go through those in this demonstration in favor of moving on to showing our support for multiple data sets. So to load extra data sets, it's the same procedure that we did earlier. We click on File, Import, or Open BDC. I'll click on Worth ARW, and I'm going to click on Domain 1, which is more of a continental uh, view in Brian's Worth simulation. That file is about 200 gigabytes in size, so this may take a few seconds to load. There we go. Now that it's loaded, I'm going to zoom out and create a new 2D renderer. But I'm going to pick domain 1 instead of domain 3. To enable it, click my checkbox. And here's the largest domain. Again, we're looking at height, I believe. If I go to my variables tab, we can see here HGT. I'm going to set that to T2. And to get a good comparison, 
between my two domains, I should use the same color palette. So I'm going to go to my Appearance tab, scroll up to my Transfer function, and set the same values that I did for my first 2D renderer. So my maximum will be, will be 293. My minimum for the Domain 1 renderer will be 289. My first opacity control point will be at 292, just like before. Two ninety two, is that right? I might have an error in my notes. If I go back here, yeah, that's two ninety two point nine. So I'm gonna change this one to two ninety two point eight point nine. And then I'll take this rightmost point, drag it all the way down, and what I'll do now is I'll disable my domain 3 to see if we have a similar structure. And you can see the bow echo right here, but since the, uh, the grid resolution, I guess, is uh, much more coarse for the larger domain, um, the bow echo is not as defined. I can turn the renderer back on for the domain 3, and we can see the higher resolution value rendered here. So that is the basic gist of how Vapor 3 works. Um, I hope that this tutorial has been a good demonstration of our new GUI and some of our new capabilities. If you guys have any questions, please email us at vapor at ucar.edu. Thank you.